So let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Karen and I'm from Data Theorem. And I'd like to, first of all, thank everybody for joining us today for this live demo. Uh, today, I'll talk about a recent hack that was presented at DEF CON, how it was executed, how this type of situation could be prevented in the future. And specifically, we'll be looking at a hack on smart devices. So this is where uh, an attacker was able to gain complete access to accounts of the smart devices, which enabled them to operate the device controls and configurations in any customer's home effectively. So you might wonder like how prevalent are smart devices and maybe you even own a few of them in your own home. So let's look at a few of the statistics around this. Uh, the popularity of smart devices and other IoT devices that can pretty much be controlled through a remote connection and an application, they're gaining popularity. And so this is seen both through consumer spending as well as overall market size. So the current annual spending is $55 billion on these smart devices and the total market size is about double that. Now, even though 70% of consumers who were surveyed in this a uh, consumers international survey that was that was done last year. Um, they were surveyed whether they own one and whether they trust them. So while 70% of the consumers do own one, they did say that they don't trust the way that their data is shared by the devices. And this could mean how the data is captured, how it's stored, or how it's accessed through remote connections. And this entire uh, smart device system and, and the way that it's architected, this can be applied to a lot of other situations and a lot of other uh, remotely controlled devices. And so I want to present a real world example. So this is, um, this is a smart device vendor, it's called HDL Automation, that's the name of the company. And they were hacked um, and it was presented at DEF CON as a report of what the hack was and, and how it was done. Um, now, HDL Automation did have a chance to respond in this situation, but in most cases, uh, this would not be a typical scenario where your company is being hacked and it's being presented in a paper or at a conference. Typically, this happens and there are uh, much bigger risks and, and issues that could happen as a result. Now, um, not only does HDL Automation distribute hardware, they also have customized mobile and web applications that allow their users to control the hardware directly from their phones or laptops. So the bugs and vulnerabilities that were found in the front end application, as well as in its associated APIs, were really what enabled the researcher to run these remote hijacking attacks on the smart devices. So just to summarize here, it's a recent story. It was presented at DEF CON 2020 a few weeks ago. HDL Automation is the name of the company. They have thousands of smart devices, uh, customers globally, and, and you know tenfold that uh, in terms of the number of devices around the world. Um, the researcher was able to uncover four unique vulnerabilities just through investigating their front end applications and the associated APIs. Uh, the company was able to react. They were able to fix all their bugs. But again, this is something that can really hurt your reputation, it could be avoided with the right prevention mechanisms in place. And I'm going to talk about that more throughout the presentation and um, specifically from a data theorem perspective, right? Because uh, how, how can data theorem help with something like this and how can you respond to it? So let's take a look at what a typical smart device system looks like. So uh, there's a lot going on in this slide and I wanna bring your attention to the right hand side, which is just a full stack application. This is what a modern application typically looks like today where you have client end app, maybe it's a mobile app, maybe it's a web app, iOS, Android, it could be a single page application for web. Now there are typically hundreds of APIs that are uh, moving data back and forth, most likely to the cloud. In other cases, it could be to remote databases or um, to, queues or serverless type systems. Again, the, the primary principle is that it goes client uh, side to remote um, with APIs kind of a, a in the middle there. Now, if you look on the left hand side in this box, um, this is pretty much what the smart device system looks like. So you have your mobile or web app, which you're using, you're controlling with your smartphone or your laptop 
um, or PC. Now, uh, you then are connected to the network, and then you are you're trans you're transporting all this data across the network to the cloud or to a remote database. Now, what HDL automation sells, because not only do they have the software, they also sell devices as well as this IP gateway. This is um, a physical box that you can plug in and it has all of these different sensors and modules that then can control the devices and that communicate with um, things in the app and so on. So effectively, um, you can use the app to control things, but on the back end, it might use this hardware box and then uh, you, you still are able to control your devices either on your local network or on, um, you know, on a remote network. So. Now, these are the smart devices on the right hand side. So they have a, a bunch of different devices that they sell. And we'll talk a little bit more about what the potential controls were. But the point here is that um, there's a lot of different entry points for a hacker in this kind of full stack application uh, architecture. And so let's talk about what the hacker did um, and how they were able to attack the full stack application. So the first thing that they did was that they took over the account and they were able to actually find a way to fully authenticate. Then they were able to uh, run a remote access through API endpoints and they did this using a SQL injection hacking attack. And they were able to pull out a bunch of customer data, customer information, including emails, Potentially, they could have gotten the passwords directly. Um, they can get gateway and home network information, location, which devices you have in your house, what controls are set to, the entire original configuration, which if you, let's say you have these devices set up in a corporate environment, well, that's a lot of data about configuration that can then be used later. So. Let's look a little bit about how they did the account takeover. So if you look in the center here, this is what the overall structure of HDL's mobile or web app really looks like. So you can log in on the left side, you log in with your email and password, and then you connect. And then you see the screen where you can control like your living room lights, you can turn on your TV, um, you can change your curtains, um, floor heating, music, so on. So you have a lot of different configuration options and controls here. And so uh, what the hacker did, first of all, he actually found out that once you first create an account, a debug email is auto-generated and it has all of the same administrative access that your original account has. So let's say your account is myuser at gmail.com. Well, once you create that account, myuser debug at gmail.com is created. And that account can then be used to uh, see all of the information in the application, all of the information in your home and the configuration and, and so on. And so what the hacker did first, he tested whether this change password could work under the forgot password query on the left side. He clicked forgot password. He was able to get an email and see, yep, I can change my password that way. Now, knowing that there was this debug account that was auto generated, he went ahead and uh, change the password on the debug account first by registering that account. So that account is a dummy account, doesn't exist, but he went and created it and then he went in and changed the password. And then he was able to get in and change all of the configuration for uh, this person's account. Now, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we can prevent this later and I'll move on and just talk about the other attacks that he did. Um, but this is some, this is a first step where he's able to take over the account and this is a really big issue. Now, um, the second thing that he did was he found uh, several APIs basically just through clicking around the application. So for example, the first thing he did was he clicked under the devices section in the UI and he got access to the search input box. And then he started searching devices and other parameters. He searched by the different parameters that he knew existed in the code. This allowed him to send a post request through the front end. And then he was able to, through this API called device by region list, he got the server database name, but he wasn't able to get other data. And he was using a SQL injection attack this entire time. Now, the second thing he did, he found this API called get room binding device. And that's where, um, that was an API triggered by clicking the room section and then search by binding devices. So if you remember the screenshot of the app, there's a bunch of different things that he could click, click on and that's how he found these APIs. 
Now he ran a SQL injection attack on this API and then that's where he found uh, the entire list that showed clients by email, their devices, network configurations, gateway, um, a lot of other information here. And at this point, HDL did implement the fixes. So he didn't continue the invest investigation, but he did say that he could have gone further. He could have figured out like what is the, um, the firmware settings or uh, what version is it. He could have found a lot of other information. Now, uh, I'll talk again about how data theorem could have helped prevent this, but let's go on to the next attack. So uh, the final one is that he found this authorization header. Um, this he found was able to fully authenticate and he found that it had the same structure with an email address and an MD5 hash user password. Now we know from the first attack, the account takeover, that he was able to change the passwords. So through this logic, he knows the email, he knows the password, he can actually create his own authorization header. The other thing he noticed was that it was using MD5 hashing, which is a weaker hashing algorithm. Um, and so now I'll start talking a little bit about uh, what data theorem could do to prevent this. So um, I'll, I'll switch gears for one second and I'll talk about us and what we do. So we are a, uh, a full stack, uh, we take a full stack approach. We're a security software program. Uh, we run automated hacking, basically taking a hacker persona, taking that perspective and running a lot of different popular attacks that we're aware of. Um, and then we also check across your entire application to find vulnerable API endpoints. So let's go back and I'll talk through what we would do in all of these situations. So the first thing, the account takeover. So um, first of all, we cover anything sensitive like emails, passwords through our dynamic analysis. Um, our scanner would find secret tokens or passwords if they're stored in your URL automatically. Um, and if the developers are putting sensitive info in get requests, we will find that. Now, the other thing is we would have flagged here that you know, two-factor authentication isn't turned on. We would flag that in our, in our uh, scanner and in our portal. And so this would have been prevented if there was um, two-factor authentication able. Um, because it probably would have found out that my user debug was a dummy account. Um, and, you know, even still, it would have found out that maybe you're generating this debug account. Maybe it doesn't need to have all the same access, um, or maybe it needs to be part of the, the screen itself. Now, um, the, second, the second attack um, we would have found because we run, uh, we, we actually run our own SQL injection attacks in our portal. Um, so we would be able, first of all, to find out if there are any vulnerable API endpoints, and then we would be able to run the SQL injection attack directly on those APIs or even, uh, you know, on, on other open uh, query areas. So we would have been able to find this right away um, in our product. And finally, we would have flagged that, you know, MD5 was being used, and I can show what this looks like. Um, this is an example of our portal, and um, this is a social networking app that was using MD5, and you can see that there are uh, red uh, alerts, and like you can see the severity, medium, and right here is an OWASP logo that alerts you, hey, this is in violation of OWASP. And once you click on one of these errors or one of these alerts, you can understand that um, you know, it tells you what the code, what where in the code you're violating uh, OWASP, what you can do differently, how you can fix it right away. We actually go one step further and provide secure code recommendations. And um, our priority marked items are basically any vulnerabilities that allow remote access of yours or your customer's data along with any app store blockers. So if you're uh, distributing an app currently, you know that has to go through the app store uh, verification and check. So um, that's something that we, we would be able to uh, flag for you right away. So uh, let me just, uh, you know, go back and talk again about what we actually do. So um, we have this analyzer engine and we're running three processes. Um, we run discovery, exposure, and remediation. And so during discovery, we're going to scan your entire app and all of its building blocks, including 
um, you know, in the cloud or APIs, we'll check all of these things to see where there might be any vulnerabilities. Maybe you don't have, um, you know, authentication properly set up, or maybe you don't have encryption turned on. So we'll check data at rest and data in transit here. And then during inspection is where we actually run our automated hacking attacks, where we'll have a series of different hacking toolkits. Um, this is where we would run something like the SQL injection attack that I alluded to earlier. Um, we, we run a few others like class site scripting and um, we have something called toxic tokens as well. Um, and then we do remediation where we actually uh, will go ahead and check you know, how can you fix this? And we can alert you here and send you notifications to help enable uh, your a lower time to fix. And you can actually automate this entire process and you can have it run um, daily or weekly, basically on any time cadence of choice. Uh, and so going in a little bit uh, in more detail here, um, during the discovery phase, the API product, it'll, it'll do an inventory of your public APIs, your API domains, your single page applications, cloud assets, even sometimes private APIs um, will do, uh, will crawl your public web domains for your app or any linked backend API sources. And then we can also integrate with cloud providers here, if that's something that you use, or API gateways to get a complete picture. So when it comes to cloud, we actually check anything from your cloud storages, like if you're using AWS S3, we can check that um, cloud databases. This is where we found leaks do happen as well. Um, but as, as seen in this earlier in this presentation, we do flag like the front end, you know, what kind of password hashing algorithms are you using and so on. We do flag that as well. And um, one of the things that we enable here, uh, we call it asset grouping, but if you have a few different apps or a few different projects, you can uh, group them and then you can assign policy. So you can decide what issues need to be prioritized. And then during inspection, we'll enforce those custom policies and we'll help evaluate for any leaky data like uh, PII, PFI, or PHI. Um, and this is really where we have our attack tools. So uh, on the right hand side here, we have hack and extract, detect and inject. So in hack and extract is where we'll actually try authentication authorization hacking attacks against your policy to see if we can extract any of the private data out. And for detect and inject, we'll try a few manipulation tactics to grab access to the data in your databases. So this will effectively allow you to configure the SQL injection attacks. And then, um, we're also checking like for leaky APIs. And so um, during remediation, I know I touched a little bit upon this, but um, we do create this auto triage with all of the alerts, as you saw in that screenshot of our portal. Um, we do help you remediate basically by including secure code suggestions, or in some cases you can actually set up auto remediation where you just press one button and it'll remediate for you. And we also provide reports. So let's say you're concerned about compliance. We do have one click reports that you can generate on the spot um, to really make sure, okay, you're, you're in line with the, these compliance requirements um, like OWASP or GDPR and so on. And again, we integrate, um, our tool integrates in any of your CI CD pipelines. So depending on what you're using, be it like Jenkins or CAD CI, we would integrate with that. Um, we do have way you can set up your notifications and um, you can actually uh, auto generate a JIRA ticket right away for things and so on. So if you'd like to learn more, you can request a demo. This is our demo site, um, datatherm.com slash demo, and you can also email us for any additional information. Uh, and I'll open up the floor right now for Q&A. So uh, let me check the chat to see if there are any questions and feel free to type them in there. Um, I'll wait a few more minutes and then let's see. Um, so the question is, do I need to share my source code in order to use your product? The answer is no. Uh, we never require your source code for the product. 
uh, we just need a version of your binary and it could be a pre-production or production binary that we use. And then uh, we can upload that and, and run it in our tool. So we never need your source code at any time. Um, all right, uh, I think that's it for today. Uh, thank you very much and uh, hope to talk to you soon. <laughs>